Um, even if there's something pressing here on UK's campus that you need to tell me about, feel free to, to take advantage of that and let me know. Let me know that I spoke while you were eating the soup. Okay? And I'll never forget, I'll, I'll always be able to remember that I was speaking to an audience while I ate soup. So just remind me of that. But uh, it seems inappropriate to talk about anything other than prints right now. And I was, some of you are so young that like you hardly, like you don't even have prints on your iPhone. You don't have prints on your Android. But those of us who are like 30 and over, uh, it's like, he, you know, he's like Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan. Like, for some people, for some people, he's like how maybe President Obama may be to you, Prince. Like, maybe that'll help you understand like how some people feel about him. Like, he's an icon to a lot of folks. And the end was just in Atlanta last week. I knew people who saw it. He did two concerts in Atlanta, and uh, just uh, reminded me of how fleeting life can be. And um, so I was devastated as so many of you were in shock that, uh, that he passed away. But I think, I think one lesson, and then I'll transition to what we're talking about today, is one lesson that I'd like to squeeze out is, like, dude lives his life. Like, full on. Squeeze, I think he squeezed every ounce of talent he took. He took major risks, musically, stylistically, uh, and was constantly ahead of the game, ahead of the curve. And uh, that's what I that's what I hope for all of you as well to take those same risks. I want to I want to do something a little different. Less than I'm here to to speak. We're we're at the University of Kentucky, so I want to teach a lesson if that's all right. Is that all right? So, I, um, I want to thank those of you who invited me and a few of you who probably even had to fight a little bit to, uh, to convince somebody that it was okay to have me here. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here, so, so thank all of you who made today possible. And uh, there's a lot of you I've worked with throughout the day and throughout the past few weeks, so thank you for that. Um, you have you have here at UK you have an ad drop period right like during registration you you have a period where you can add a class or drop a class and um, I was in grad school very recently and I was in my my ad drop period and I was in one of those classes and this has happened to all of us where I I dislike the class so much that I was just like, I think I'm going to drop the class. But, you know, normally by the time you decide to drop the class, all the classes that were worth adding have already been filled up, right? The popular professors, their classes are past the max. So I looked at what was available and uh, just decided, you know what, I'm, I'm stuck. <laughs> and it's just, it's just going to be one of those moments where I had to stick it out. And I kid you not, the week after I thought I was stuck, the professor taught something that really shaped the way I have seen the past few years um, that have impacted me very deeply and really shaped how I see injustice in America in a lot of ways. And I want to teach you that lesson and um, I hope it sticks with you and I hope it gives you um, a new lens, if you will, to consider the wrongs of our country and of the world. So, on the screen is a professor named Leopold von Ronke, and this picture was probably taken in the mid-1800s or so. And he's kind of thought of as the father of historians. Like, before Leopold von Ronke, the study of history, like history as a major, if you will, really wasn't that big of a thing. And he made the study of history into a a field that people took seriously. And he was really a pioneer in that field. And he did something that, when I learned it this in this class that I was about to drop, and I'm so thankful and glad that I didn't. He decided in the 1800s to do something that at that time was actually pretty revolutionary. And you have to think that in the mid-1800s, we're talking, obviously, pre-internet, 
free computer, free television, that the international travel systems were different, that communication systems for how if you were in Germany in the 1850s, how you communicated with the rest of the world was extremely difficult. How you learned about the world was extremely difficult. And so people often really only had deep knowledge about their immediate area. Like, there was, there was no Wikipedia, okay? There was no Google. I know that goes without saying, but you have to sometimes imagine what life would be like without electricity and you live in Lexington. Okay, all of a sudden, if there, are, if there are no telephones, no computers, no televisions, no radios, and something crazy goes on somewhere else in the world, how long does it take to even reach you? And how much do you even know about it? So knowledge back in the day was very isolated. And, and I'm not even getting into it, but that had a lot to do if, like, if we went back and studied, you know, there's a movie coming out about the life and revolution of Nat Turner. And what frightened the United States about that revolt was not just the revolt itself, but that the information that, that, that it would spread, that the knowledge, that the news, the news of the revolt would spread and that people would be inspired by it, but that was a very, very difficult thing. Leopold von Ranke in 1850s in Germany, he said he wanted to do something that really up to that point had never been done before. He wanted to lay out all of human history, the most that he could find, all the major events of human history, he wanted to lay them out in chronological order. He wanted to study all, that's a, that's a picture of a thousand different people. Now, Von Ranke, there might be a few people on here that Von Ranke knew of, but I see like Conan O'Brien, you may see some familiar faces on there. But do you see somebody you recognize, somebody you like? Anyway, here, we'll see. Von Ranke decided, you know what? I'm gonna lay out every known face, every name, every event, Every, every known event, every war, every famine, every advancement. And it was, it was really, in a lot of ways, it was, part of it was his life's work. So he wanted to lay it all out in chronological order. And, and he wanted to see if he saw any trends. That was actually a really powerful thought because there was a trend that existed or that people believed existed and his research determined that that trend actually was not a reality. And, and that's going to get to the root of what we're talking about today. So the trend was, or the belief was, rather, that human beings are steadily getting better. Okay, so the, the belief was that, hello, that in the 1500s, people got a little better in the 1600s, if you will, a little better in the 1700s, a little better in the 1800s, the 1900s, the 2000s, and here is our glorious future, okay? That is, in a lot of ways, and, and psychologists and psychiatrists have studied this, this notion that human beings are steadily getting better over time is still widely believed and accepted to this very day. That if you ask people informally, and these studies have been done, like, do you think that 2016 is an improvement over 2006, is an improvement over 1996, is an improvement over 1980. And by and large, people will say, yeah, I believe that. I believe that here's 1956, here's 1966, here's 1976, 86, 96, 2006, and here we are in 2016. It's just, in, in some ways, psychiatrists suggest that we want to believe that. Right, that, and I understand that. We want to believe that human beings, us, we want to believe that we are steadily improving. And Von Ranke, though, when he laid out all of human history and looked at the trends of the quality of the way people treated one another, what he determined really was that, no, human beings are not steadily getting better. He laid it all out. It looks a lot more like this, okay? That sometimes humanity 
is on this beautiful incline where the way people treat one another, the way, the, the way they interact with one another, the way society evolves and improves, sometimes, Von Rocky found, sometimes it's on this beautiful incline and hits these peaks. And then sometimes, that's just not true. Sometimes, people, you've experienced it, because if you've, if you've lived one day as an adult, people can suck, right? And in essence, that's what Von Rocky's research found, is that no, people are not always getting better. They're, each year is not 365 days of improvement. That's not, how, that's not how the real world works. Idealistically, that's how we would work. And but he found sometimes human beings are getting better, and it's beautiful, and it's powerful, and it's inspiring, and sometimes they aren't. Sometimes human beings get worse. Sometimes, sometimes they get way worse. Sometimes, sometimes we're at that peak, sometimes we drop. If human beings were steadily getting better, how do we explain the transatlantic slave trade? Right? Because that, that didn't happen, that didn't happen at 4,000 AD, where human beings existed. Like, we're not even, we're not new to this earth. Like, we've had a lot of opportunities to get it right. Like, in the scheme of world history, this was yesterday. Like, in the scheme, if we laid out Von Ronke's graph, this, this looks like it took place last night. In the scheme of world history, 1860 doesn't look a lot different than 2016 when you look at a chronological chart. But if human beings were steadily getting better, how do we explain that millions of men, women, and children were bought and sold and shipped? How do we even explain that a picture like this exists where people decided exactly how many human beings can we fit? If we were steadily getting better, why does this photo exist? What do you imagine happened to him? Just play around with that in your mind. If we were steadily getting better, how do we explain him? If human beings were steadily getting better, if, if here we were, early humans, we just kept getting better and better and better and better, how do we explain? How do we explain, how do we explain them? How do we explain the Holocaust? where millions and millions and millions of people in a short period of just a few years were worked to death, starved to death, brutalized and killed. Millions. This, this is a pile, this, this is in Auschwitz where they had death camps and this pile of shoes, these are shoes mainly of women and children who, when they got off the train, they made them take their shoes off. And this pile of shoes, if we were steadily getting better, how do we explain that pile of shoes? You, are you, you see what I'm saying? Like, just logically, if we were always getting better, if, this is us right now. If we were steadily getting better, how do we explain Rwandan genocide? Right? A lot of you in this room were alive when this happened. When a million people, almost without any guns, were hacked to death in a period of about 90 days. This is at a memorial <coughs> in Rwanda. Like, how do we explain that? How do we explain it? We explain it by accepting that this is probably a more realistic, to be clear, somebody, I spoke at Princeton last week and somebody said, Sean, how did you create that graph of the quality of humanity? Uh, I just made that up right there, okay? Like, that, this isn't like, that, that's not 1950 and that's not, that's not 1900. This is to show you the possibility of rises and dips. That if we together, if we together, decided, let's, let's qualitatively 
let's look and decide how human beings treated each other over time and gave it a score of some kind, okay, some quotient, the graph that we would create would look something like this. That's, that's my hypothesis. That was what Leopold von Ranke suggested. That it was actually, he didn't, uh, he didn't use the term roller coaster because there were no roller coasters. Okay, but he did talk about peaks and valleys and mountains and highs and lows. That this is more of the reality of the history of humanity. This number, this number is, to, to me, one of the most disturbing numbers in our lifetime. Last year, in 2015, 102 unarmed African Americans were shot and killed by police. 102. Well, it's hard to grasp, okay? It's hard to grasp, well, is that a lot? Like, hell, I don't know. Is that a lot? 102 people is a lot, but we're in a country, we live in a country with millions of people. Let me, let me give you some context, okay? Does anyone even know who that president is? Wow. It's McKinley. It's McKinley. Right. He was president so long ago that we hardly recognize him. We would have to go back. He was our 25th president, and he was assassinated, and uh, Roosevelt took his place. Okay? The last year that 102 African Americans were lynched in the United States, he was president. 1901. Every year since 1901, fewer, fewer than 102 African Americans every year since 1901 were lynched in this country. Last year, not, not when he was president, last year, 102 completely unarmed African Americans were killed by police, and that does not include Sandra Bland and other cases that are yet to be determined. Okay, so that, and, and, this also does not include the number of people who were killed in jails and prisons in other circumstances that are very difficult to determine. All right, that number could be 150, 170. We know that 102 completely unarmed African Americans were killed by police last year, and that you have to go all the way back to when McKinley was president. If, if, if we were steadily improving, how do we explain this graph, right? If we're steadily getting better, how do we explain that from 1925 to 1970, that America's prison population was very steady, right? Then something happened. Something drastic happened. And it's, I would argue with any human being that what happened after 1970 is absolutely not an improvement. I don't know that any reasonable person across any political boundaries, Democrat or Republican or Independent, conservative or liberal, progressive, whatever, would argue that after 1970, America got a whole lot better on this graph. Right? Can we agree? Can we agree with one another that what happened that's not good. It's not good. In, indeed, and I wrote about this, and it, it's, it's out there, you can Google it. And I, I would encourage you to fact check anything that I'm saying today. That what we know happened between 1970 and 1978, first of all, I don't know how many of you have read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Pro. Right? It's, the no book has probably impacted me more over the past few years than her book. She's a powerful law professor at Ohio State University. She can teach anywhere in the world. Brilliant legal scholar, brilliant mind. It's weird though, because a lot of people own it, but actually haven't read it. But like, let me give you a pro tip. If you own New Jim Pro and it's on your, it's in your Kindle, you have to push it. <laughs> and it does this thing, when you push it, it starts to load. Then you gotta push it again, and it opens up on your iPad and your Kindle device, and you can read it. 
It's a powerful read, but let me summarize it in, in 30 seconds. Michelle Alexander says, no, this system is not broken. It is functioning exactly the way it was designed. That this was not an accident, and it was not a great system that's now somehow messing up. In 300 pages, she says, no, it was built to do this. And not only that, and it's doing it really, really well. As you see, amazing growth. That's, that's the Sean's notes of New Jim Crow. And you'll see I wrote about this from 1970 to 1978. Richard Nixon was president, and it was recently discovered, which we already knew, but to, to read it was powerful, where his director of public policy said, on record, he has since passed away, and his interview was just discovered, where he said, we knew we could not make it a crime to be black. So we found every way we could to make it a crime to be black, without actually saying that. He said this. He said he did that. He was the director of policy for Richard Nixon, who was president right here when the shift happens. Look, if we are steadily getting better, explain that. Right? That more people per 100,000 are incarcerated in our country than any of these countries. So and so that when you look at <coughs> Denmark or Sweden or India, we're talking about we incarcerate hundreds of times more per 100,000 people. That right now, okay, we're talking about Von Ronke, world history. Right now, more people are incarcerated in America. I want you to add this extra bit to it. Not in any other country in the world, but than in any other country in the history of the world. That's a pretty damn long time. That more people in this country are incarcerated than have ever been incarcerated in the history of humanity. How are we getting better? I want you to see this. This is in Texas at a pool party. He's 14 in a bathing suit. The brothers are upset he pulls the gun on her. Like what is he, what is he, what's, what's he achieving here? And who is this man? <laughs> who is he? Why, why is he so comfortable and everybody else so damn uncomfortable? Yeah, he's now putting his full weight on her back, smashing her into the grass. For what? Explain to me, for what? Okay. We're getting better if we're getting better. We're getting better. How do we explain this? One of my one of my heroes is here, Mr. Chester Grundy, who's an icon here at the University of Kentucky. who tell me that like, some of this behavior is behavior they didn't see in their childhood. Like, Mr. Grundy, watch this. This is in South Carolina, and I know this girl. Okay, I advocated for her, and listen. How are we getting better? He throws her six feet. 
Same thing, puts his body weight on her, handcuffs her. She's charged with a crime. Okay? Atlanta is like the retirement community for the civil rights movement in a lot of ways. There's so many just legends and heroes who live there who tell me that when they were growing up, there were a lot of places they did not feel safe. But school was not one of those places. By and large, they believed that once they made it through the door, there were problems. I have yet to find somebody, one person, who, tell, who can tell me of an instance of an instance of this happening in the 50s or 60s in a classroom. Mr. Brunner, have you ever heard of something like this happening when you were young? Never. Never. Well, how, well how, how, how is that an improvement, right? I'm, pre I'm pressing my case very vigorously. I haven't found one person who said they ever, ever, ever heard it. Let me explain this to you. Because people are so insincere and dishonest on the internet that they lied about what happened in this classroom. This is a young girl who lives in a foster home. A very quiet, sweet young lady. I know her attorney. She had a cell phone out in class, right? Have you done that before? Who the hell has it, right? She had her cell phone out and was asked to put it up. Guess what she did? She put it up. The teacher changed his mind and said, no, 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 give it to me. Well, at that point, she shut down, like almost went catatonic. Never said another word. People lied and said, and used uh, black women stereotypes about how she blew up, caught an attitude, you know, none of that happened. Fake, complete fabrication. She went quiet. That phone to her was her lifeline to the rest of the world. And in her mind, which was reasonable, she had put it up, and she wasn't about to give it to somebody. This man, this, this terrible excuse for a teacher with the white shirt on right there, then decides he's going to call the police. <laughs> right? He did. And this man, officer, Officer Ben Fields is the strength and conditioning coach for the high school football team and set records for powerlifting. You can see he has bodybuilding videos on YouTube. And he throws her like a rag doll, and she was charged with the crime. <coughs> this is in Kentucky. And a Donald Trump rally. She's a college student. I know her. Her name is Shia. saying, and they want us to be so nice. What's he talking about? Like, he won Kentucky by a landslide, right? How? Tell me, had you ever seen it, had, just you, had you seen anything like this before? I, I, where? Where? Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right here, of course, you've seen that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other than that is what I meant, right? <laughs> I've never seen anything like this before. Look at this. See the man in the hat right there? Watch what he does. Let's see if we can get the video to play here. Video, let me show you. What he does is he goes up and throws a brutal elbow right to the face of a black man who was being escorted out of there. The black man did nothing to him. He throws the elbow, then they do an interview with him after he assaults the man. Here's what he says. Hold on. Got an old school computer up here. <laughs> here we go. He liked it. Next time we see him, we might have to kill him. 
<laughs> you, you have to laugh to keep from bubbling over with anger, right? He actually assaulted this man, embarrassed him, humiliated him. The question is, how are we getting better? And I think the answer is, no, we're not. We're not getting better. I want to suggest to you that sometimes we get better and sometimes there's a dip. The dip in the quality of the way human beings interact with each other. And it does, it, it does vary a lot from country to country, city to city, state to state. I want to suggest to you nationally that we are currently in a dip. And that the facts, the facts bear that out. Any one of these facts alone, the criminal justice facts, the incarceration facts alone prove that we're in a dip. The 102 unarmed African Americans who were killed last year, do you know how many police officers were convicted for killing those 102 African Americans? Zero. Zero. Were you in my class earlier? <laughs> Last year, 1,207 people were killed by American police. I want to push that a little bit. The highest reported number in American history, 1,207 people were killed by American police. How many police officers do you think were convicted in any of those deaths? Zero. None. Statistically, that's ridiculous. Well, I'm just talking about math. That's illogical. That 1,207 people were killed by American police and 100% of them were just fine? Like that's not, that ratio doesn't exist in any profession. Not in the medical profession. Not in the legal profession. You go to any profession, 100% of everything isn't right. It's not how it works. That's not, statistically that's impossible. We're in a dip. Here's the beauty of being in a dip, and I see some of it now, actually. When you are in a dip, eventually you come out of it. And this is what Von Rocky proved. Now, sadly, but beautifully, this dip can actually be hundred, like the transatlantic slave trade was not a decade. All right, it was for centuries. Dips can last a long time. But over the course of all of human history, people always come out of it. Always. It always changes. And I think some of what you're seeing right now, like, I think, culturally, and I won't even have time to unpack all of it, like, I think we have today, we have Kendrick Lamar, because we're in a dip, and Kendrick Lamar helps us get out of the dip. Like the fact that The Birth of a Nation, the new Nat Turner movie, the fact that that's being produced, uh, the man who produced it openly said he produced it to reflect the reality that sometimes people respond to the dip. He talked at great length. Nate Parker talked about how he produced the film, not just because he wanted to tell Nat Turner's story, but that he wanted to show people that there are times where people are in the dip, and they say, I'm tired of being in the dip, and I want to get out of the dip, and I'll do any damn thing to get out of it. And we do always get out of it. That's the beautiful news, that there are dips. Like, do you, do you at least accept that, let me show you, do you at least accept that that's not real life? That's not real life, okay? Now, some things always get better. I'll close with this and I'll transition, I'll transition with this final thought. And then in a few minutes we'll take some questions and then some, some amazing students are gonna come up and present more about uh, about media bias, we're talking about how to properly tell stories. But let me close with this thought. What people often confuse is innovations of technology with improvements in humanity. 
<laughs> okay, not, they're not the same thing. A faster, bigger cell phone doesn't mean you are a better human being. Doesn't it? This, now, that is true. That this scale, if we talk about the quality and the improvement of technology, communication systems, better and better and better. But you could argue that the systems are getting better, but we're not necessarily communicating better. But that the system got better. Transportation. Like back here, they're just trying to make, to figure out how to keep the wheel round. Right? How to keep the wheel from breaking with weight on it. Now, we're, you know, we're talking about outer space, right? Some, something here that they would have never imagined here. But what we often confuse is the amazing improvement. Like, how many of you are old enough to remember life before flat screen televisions? You remember, right? Like, it's almost, like, do you know my kids, my children, do not know life without flat screen? Like, that's the difference. Like, between my kids and you, like, they have no idea that TVs used to be this deep. <laughs> right, right, they were so big, right? So big. They never saw TVs built into wood. Like, it used to be TV and furniture all built in one piece. They've never seen, never seen it before. And we confuse how technology changes with the quality of humanity, but they're not the same. Now, if, if we are to rise out of this dip, it never happens on accident. As a, as a matter of fact, the longer there is a lack of deliberate effort to get out of the dip, the longer the dip lasts. You can stay in that dip that was intended for decades, you can stay in there for centuries, unless you fight against it and change it. Now, to transition and to, and to bring up the young people, you guys can come on up if you, if you will. In a lot of ways, I want to suggest that if we truly understood that we were in this dip, it would inform the way we talk about injustice. It would inform the way we see the world. Like, for instance, I said it like this, and we, we, we spent some time together this afternoon, and we were right by a window, and they were interviewing me on camera. And I said, what have you learned that a tornado is coming right toward this building, and it's 90 seconds away, would that change the tone of this interview? And, and eventually we concluded, no, it would not just change the tone, the interview would end. <laughs> we would put down the camera and the mic, because talking would not seem to be the best choice at that time. Right? The analogy is, if you truly accepted the reality that you were in a dip, Maybe you would act like you were in a dip. Yeah. Right? Because when you're in it, when you're in it, when the tornado is coming for the window, you behave a little different. Right, right. Right? When you see that 102 number and realize, do you know that the deadliest hate crime of the past 75 years in our country, do you know when that happened? Last year, in Charleston, South Carolina, when nine African Americans were killed in the middle of a Bible study. The deadliest hate crime against African Americans in this country in the past 75 years was not in the Civil Rights Movement. It was not in the 70s or 80s. It was last year, on our watch, that because we're in a dip. And when you accept that reality that, oh my God, this is way worse than I actually understood, you respond differently. You change your career path. You change the way you talk about issues, right? And it affects storytelling. And what I've tried to do today is to tell you a story 
And what they're going to present to you is how often stories are told like we're in the rise when we're really in the dip. In part, because people who are profiting from the dip make the news. Scary thought. They make the news, so they tell you there is no dip. And it's getting better and better. And they'll, they'll flash a picture of an Obama rally from 2008. Or they'll show you a picture of Oprah Winfrey. And, show, and ask you, legitimately, how could we be in a dip if we have Oprah Winfrey? Right? Could it be? Could it be a dip? We could not have a dip if we also have President Obama. Not knowing that everybody who makes this dip possible hated him, never voted for him, and that hate groups have continued to rise, and that people profit off of convincing us no dip exists. And they'll tell you that story of, of media bias. But I hope if you have any questions or if you need any clarity that we can get to it, all right? Thank you so much.
There is some truth behind some of the points they bring up. Time Warner and Comcast, as you guys mentioned, are two of the biggest media companies in the world today. And during the 2014 election cycle, they both spent, they both distributed $5.9 million in campaign contributions and spent $25 million on lobbying just last year. But what effect do you think this has on our society? Well, I think this is like extremely relevant right now during the presidential election because I was doing some research of my own and I found out that Time Warner and Viacom were on Hillary Clinton's super PAC, which I thought was really telling. And then I started reading and I found out that that's like totally okay, the thing that happens all the time. Mm -hmm.
So let's just talk about how the media tracks the stories on recent events. Just by a show of hands, <coughs> how many people have heard about the attacks in Paris? Right? Almost everybody, right? I don't know guys know about this. Facebook, Twitter. Facebook even had a, um, a filter for your photos, right? For temporary photos. Okay, awesome. And the way that they say, well, it's not awesome, sorry. But <laughs> the way that they, like, um, push these stories that there's Paris, strikes in Paris, and Paris, not Paris, basically, pray for Paris, that was like hashtag, right, everything. And we do need to, you know, pray for these people and things like that. But how many of you guys heard of the ISIS attack in Beirut a day before the Paris? Significantly less, right? And this one is a lot of the suicide bombings, but at least 37, um, Beirut attack, suicide bombers, so it's still a big deal. What do you guys think is the difference in why one was covered more? I feel like one, uh, I think we're allies with France, I think it is. I'm sorry, can you speak a little louder? Like, we're allies with France, but it's probably UN number two. That one has a lot more people in it than that one does. Okay. So, 130 different jobs might take some more than <laughs> Indicted in white Waco, biker girl killed nine. That's the headline. So let's 
here we have actual surveillance footage of the place where this biker brawls took place. But before we do that, what is a brawl? When you hear brawl, what do you think? Fight? You can say yeah, you don't hear fight, brawl, a scuffle, is that like <laughs> <laughs> kind of look at it and no offense to anybody in here but um whenever it's like more majority of like a white white crime like the biker incident that was pretty much all white people it gets portrayed in kind of like their sweetest sense um but flip that into something that happens at like uh, my hometown birmingham or chicago or like a heavily urban city where it happens every day it gets it get labeled more as like a shootout or more of like kind of a more violent ways and I think it's just like another example of how that got shaped in this incident. One thing that stood out to me was this story, the Oklahoma shooting gang related. They're questioning if this one is gang related. And this is actually two biker gangs. <laughs> gang <laughs> There's nothing about gang or anything yeah. really happening. I have a question. So why is it like worded like that? Because I wouldn't be like that they have like the gang the picture right there and it's questioning if they're gang I don't even create my own headlines. There's a whole separate 
game of people. And, and so when you're dealing with people who see the world, and like I said, this is like everybody's vibes. All of us in the room have vibes. Now, some of this I believe, obviously I believe is deliberate, but even some of it may be unconscious. But whatever the case, it's clear, it's obvious that it happens, but you have to get to the root of who creates the headlines. Why do they create them that way? And uh, it's very simplistic to say that it's racial alone. It's also, it's also age, it's a, it's a lot, there are a lot of factors there, but um, it's disturbing for sure. It's very disturbing. So, so that they're all biased. And obviously, we can see the biases come out in news pieces. So, what tips do you have for people that are readers of news in order to dissect the bias from their pieces and take away a true story rather than what someone wants them to feel? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't trust any news source completely, including the one that I work for, American News. I, I, trust I trust a few individual journals. Um, but I would be, by and large, I start out from the vantage point of this is a biased piece. I start out, I start out there, and you almost have to convince me otherwise. And I start out not quite believing what I see and then work my way back from that versus starting out from the point of believing it and having to be proven wrong there. And um, because stories are almost always told from the position of power. Of be it a, a pre the UK's president uh, or a police officer or a prosecutor, and the stories, particularly the stories like we see up here, are almost always told from the angle of the people of power, and uh, that's the problem. And, and you get you get to the reality that when you deal with the stories of people who are oppressed people, uh, the people who write the stories probably have no history, no relationship, no experience. Every interaction with those people, and uh, and it shows in the way they write. So I'm very, I'm very skeptical of most of what I, I see. It as a journalist, I'm very I'm high. and most journalists, if you ask them to give you the answer off the record, will tell you not to not to just by default believe something because it's been printed. It's a bad, it's a bad practice. And to go along with that, also we just wanted to mention how like sometimes on. Um, Social media, right? That's a new thing, a new wave that, well, it can't happen to us, but the universe is kind of, it's a new wave that kind of influences the way that we get our media as well. And so even though you may have um, these verified accounts, these trusted journalists, sometimes they just go with what they hear first and want to get it out first, and you're not held accountable for the same standards as if you were to print it. Because if you were to print incorrect information, then action would have to be taken, right? Because you're the representative of your newspaper, but online, on social media, that's not necessarily the case. And so we just challenge you all to really, like, when giving any information, really try to dissect it using the tools that we've all talked about here today, and just to try to really, like, understand the truth and the meaning behind everything. Everyone does have their own biases. If we write a story, it may be different from someone else because we have different perspectives. But making sure that you're not just relying on one person for your information, we are in a place where we have multiple outlets, but being able to decipher, you know, is a skill that we should all like charge ourselves to do. Well, if y'all remember that story, uh, the owner of the restaurant knew they were coming because they had a beat. So they had made space for these people to come to set up their little discussion. So some of those fighters were professional, so that's the reason why that the uh, journalists that wrote this probably knew some of those professional people and did not want them to be like uh, being prosecuted. So they have people on the inside, but that's the reason why uh, it's uh, worded the way it is. So when it comes to trial, they'll say they don't have any criminal reference, let's just get them what they want. Right. See, well, these other people, they don't care. They have no uh, one inside, no one with any you know, power. That's how they do things like that. You know, I would say too that um, one of the advantages of this uh, communication rich environment is that there's always an opportunity to interrogate this kind of corporate media against alternative media. 
So, you know, it, it takes a little more effort, but there are a lot of other news sources available, you know, that, that students in general, the public does not make use of. But, it, I mean, when you look at international media, or when you look at progressive media within this country, there's sources like Democracy Now!, Alternate, I mean, there's a number of sources that you can interrogate these stories against. So if you depend on this for your understanding of what's going on, you're going to be awful misinformed and, and terribly biased. Because anyone who does that has ill intent. 
right? And so many of you, and I'm so disturbed by this, have told me of so many different instances where you have voiced your concerns and issues about safety and racial intimidation and harassment on campus, on Yik Yak, in, in, many, in, in casual racism. And, 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 and you have found people to listen to you. That's, that's great. And I have, I have found other campuses where people aren't even listening to that. But almost without fail, student after student after student after student told me that I feel that people are listening and doing nothing about it. And that hurts. Because like you don't get a discount in tuition for that. It's like, like, right, is your student loan rate lower? Because you expressed a concern and it wasn't, it wasn't validated and, and treated seriously? Like, I do believe very, very sincerely that if some other particular group, no need, no need to isolate people and name them, expressed so vigorously, so repeatedly, over and over and over again, I feel unsafe because of what's happening here, that it would be, in essence, dismissed. And I'm, I'm frustrated by that because UK can do better. It should do better. And, and the students deserve better. And I, I think in that sense, I'm going to say that, that even that to me suggests the, the dip is even real for UK students. That, I mean, so many of you have told me, it's exactly what I'm trying to say, that it doesn't quite feel like 2016. And like, and maybe you hear people say that a lot, hear that all the time, like, is this 1956 or is this 2016? Like, have you heard that type of phrase? Like, is this, is this, and then people, you know, say some old year, or is this 2016? That's because we are experiencing things that people experienced in previous dips. And a, a time and time out, if you go and you read media from 1875, you will see newspaper articles of people telling African Americans, like, what are you complaining about? Slavery is over. There's no one's like, what's wrong with you? You can go back to the 1920s after the lowest part of lynching, and they're like, listen, this country is so much better. What's your problem? And what that's indicative of is people who don't experience the oppression for themselves are too often very dismissive of it. And listening is not, is not enough, right? And that's what so many of you have told me. It's like, wow, I feel that people at least will come and listen, but not listen and respond. And uh, so as a student, I encourage you to continue to, to fight for the response yes. and not just the opportunity to be heard. And, um, I, and I'll help you in that any way that I can. So uh, I, I do want to take as many questions as I can. And I'm going to... Forgive me for being brief, but I'm going to try to answer all of them so my answers won't be as robust as, as they could. Okay, we'll start over here and work our way over. Hey, what's your name? I'm James. Uh, we talked about training a lot. You, you want people to come down or line up or? Okay. James? So we talked about training with media a lot and everything. I don't think that's something that will ever change. <laughs> Um, but something we also talked about, which I don't think we talked about enough, was the campaign finance. Yeah. And, you know, the media giving $5.9 million, more, much, much more money this year in the campaign, to mention some eyes on the dollar contribution. Do you believe that, you know, camp, campaign finance is an issue that yeah. you know, out of here? Yeah, listen, I think it is one of See, because campaign finance doesn't make you, campaign finance issues don't make you bleed literally, it's easy to ignore them. I think it's one of the most disturbing issues of our time, and it is one of the, I'm not even trying to be political, I'm just being factual here, it's one of the reasons why I chose to support Bernie Sanders so vigorously, because he has not received a dollar from any of those corporations, companies, super PACs, and that's a revolutionary idea. Like, Nobody in our modern political era has ever said, you know what, I'll, I'll, I don't want a penny of it. I'm just going to, and, and, had a, and, and had a successful campaign. He's won 15 states. And so for me, yeah, I mean, I am disturbed by corporate money 
in political campaigns. And for anybody to say with sincerity that corporations give you millions of dollars and expect nothing in return, you're not being sincere. That's, that's, Ill, that's, that's illogical. Like, if so, just send me a check. Right? <laughs> right, just, 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 you expect nothing. Let's just dole out checks. If, if it's for nothing, why do you pay your workers so little? Just, if, you just, if you're just throwing out money for no good reason. Right? That's, that's not how it works. They throw out money because they, they, they expect influence. They expect, it's a deal. It's a quid, a quid pro quo. And anybody who says otherwise, it's just, it, that's illogical. And, and so no, it, that would be, it's ugly that it's even a reality. And it shouldn't be, and I think it's something that we should continue to fight for beyond this, beyond this election cycle. Maybe it's something that we could have, and we, we could win on, you know? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Maria. What Hi. advice would you give to Mexican, student, Mexican American students like myself who, and who are disheartened by like, um, like Trump messages yeah. on um, important UK statutes or uh, African American students who are disheartened by um, the Confederate flag flying around? Yeah. Well, thank you for your question, then. No, I, you know, just know that you're not alone. And I say that very literally and figuratively. Anybody who reads what I write, I, I, I'm deeply disturbed by um, the hate toward immigrants and Latinos and our Muslim sisters and brothers. And, and what I do see happening in this country is something that I haven't quite seen before, is people who normally would not unify with one another are unifying in some fresh and new ways. Like, just to be there, like, just tell my story. I have more friends who are a part of all of those demographics that you just named than I ever have in part because we have realized how smart it is to support one another. And, and in fact, I think it's people in power, it's their worst nightmare, this notion that all people of color would unify together. All all, all people who despise hate in general. Like they don't want it, you know, they don't want groups who typically, like, this should be a huge story. Bernie, Bernie Sanders is immensely popular among Muslims. He's a, Jew, a Jewish American, but has huge Muslim support because they trust him and believe in him. And, but it's not, but it doesn't make the news. But I think what it does say is that, and he spoke very vigorously, at least in a presidential way, against some of the ugliness that goes on in Israel and Palestine. He said more than any other presidential candidate on that stage or any other stage. And, and that's because a lot of people are putting aside the, the, the things that used to divide them. But let me tell you, it's very liberating to speak up for somebody else. And I'll say, like, that's a new thing for me. Historically, I have almost exclusively advocated for black issues. And um, I find it very empowering for me. You know, I am a, uh, you know, a heterosexual man, but I regularly speak out on oppression and ugliness against the LGBTQ community. Just because we are all deeply connected. And what happens to one of us will at one point in time affect all of us. And so, for those of you who are only, I, I get it. For those of you that are only speaking out on issues that affect you directly, just try that, try that other thing. And uh, it's, it's, it's deeply, it, it does more to you than you might imagine. And, and I said there's someone who is new to doing it. Yes, sir. I'll come to you next. Thank you. My name is Mike. I'm Mike. My question is to you is about the disconnect between global uh, thought, social media, indignation at the national level, but not at the local level. We have a couple of pressing Lexington issues. One is related to a high school here called Lexington Catholic, yeah, where uh, children are being terrorized 
Yeah. One child was afraid of the plane. And it's not a fantasy here because of Georgetown College here. We have a which will be passed in South America. Um, but nothing. Kentucky has an ugly history of lynching that goes back 100 years. Anybody who studied Kentucky's history, including my hometown for sales, I mean, there's a book, there's an entire book on the history of lynching in Kentucky. You Google that, it's on Amazon or anywhere else. Like, it's an ugly history. So when somebody dibble dabbles in text, I saw the text where a football a football player texted a young black student at school about lynching and all manner of other yeah, stuff. Right? went out to the whole football team. Right. But, but here's the thing, nothing happened. Right. And ironically, the police arrested him only after you posted something about it. Right. Daily news. Right. And we have another issue. Sorry, no, it'll take a lot of time. Where we have these sculptures downtown that when we moved here, my wife said, Why are we moving to this place? Why is when they when there are these civil war, uh, southern civil war people right. here in the middle of the town. Um, but and then you know we had a meeting <coughs> downtown Chester which he stepped out. <laughs> but there weren't any students there downtown. So how do I get these young people? I, mean, I, I can't speak for them, but I, I was a student. I'm deeply connected to a lot of students. They're so busy, so smart. And they're also deeply bothered by so many things that affect them directly here on campus. They're bothered, they are bothered by that. But there also there is a limited, what I would call bandwidth. Part, part of the problem of being in that dip is that there are more problems than you have capacity to address. And so often, often it, it, it often is heartbreaking even for me, because the truth is I know that by spending 30 minutes to talk about problems, that probably means there's 30 minutes of other problems that I didn't address, right? And so I wouldn't think so much about numbers matter. But intensity matters as well. And, and sometimes you have to act as intensely as you can on your own and, and just add a student here and a student there, or a person here and a person there. And it's very, it's very unpopular, you know, but you, maybe you should just consider taking them down yourself and seeing what happens. You know? And it happens all around the world. No, I mean, I say, I say that in all, in all seriousness. Like, we're, we're very inspired right now about what happened in South Africa because uh, at University of, and I lived in South Africa for a big chunk of last year at the University of Cape Town. There's an enormous statue of Cecil Rhodes, who was an, a deeply, deeply racist man. And there's a, a huge mammoth statue of him in the middle of South Africa. It's like, and, and students in South Africa, in part inspired by. Ferguson and our own protest, it's like, no, we're not. You're not going to have that statue here anymore. And they protested, and they protested, and protested, and they, they kept it there. And then they started spray painting it. And then they started defecating on it. No, like, legitimately. That's what they did. And they started camping out there, and just, they eventually just said, no, let's just take it down and see what happens. And took it down. It was very difficult. It was a very difficult. Tenuous moment. You know, I I should remind you, uh, as a you know, you know, there there are there are times where you have to make enormous sacrifices for what you believe in. You know, and uh, I'm thinking about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was an amazing uh, scholar in New York. His name is very difficult to spell. I will spell it out loud. But um, he decided, as a Christian, as a Christian uh, that he was so disturbed by Adolf Hitler, and he was a PhD, amazing man, brilliant man. His books are some of my favorite theological books. He decided he was so disturbed by Hitler that he was going to go to Hitler, he was going to go to Germany and kill him. Hi, he was a pastor, and they they killed, they, they uncovered his plot, and they killed Dietrich Bonhoeffer and those who traveled. But like, I have, I have to ask, like, it's a very it's a very difficult question, but I ask people, was Nat Turner wrong for what he did? 
lot of layers to that answer. And, and you get very different answers depending on who you ask and where, and where in the country you are when you ask the question. So would it be wrong to just take those statues down? I, wrong for who? <coughs> No, it's worth considering, you know, and I agree. Okay, so I have time for just one, one more question. Okay, so I do want to say that my, I'm sorry, that my uh, email is in my bio. I would love to uh, take some more of your questions. I hate, I hate to even choose, so um, I am going to choose someone because I am biased. This is my friend Samantha. And uh, so, but any of you who don't, I can hang out after, okay? Um, I just was curious about, um, there was a YouTube video that was kind of pieced together, um, I guess in the last year or two, that shows UK <laughs> students not rioting, but, you know, having a field day after the games. I just was, you know, curious about what your opinion was, and they show, I mean, Baltimore kind of is a little different, you know, they're not cheering on or going off about a game, but people that I know that lived in Baltimore didn't have that same experience that we were, that we were shown on the media or through the media. And so I just thought it was the same thing with these articles, headlines. I um, thought it was very interesting. And because we are at UK, I just wanted to hear some feedback. And I would be interested in hearing from students also how they feel about that. Um, you know, when you lose a game or, or whatever causes burning of, the burning of the couch or riding in the streets and, you know, whatever. I just think it's very interesting that we're here and we're just going to hear about that. Yeah, yeah, I remember, remember that. You know, that, that's a, na it's a national phenomenon. And that it, it gets to the root of, of why that presentation that the students did was so good that almost identical violence or identical actions are characterized in wildly different ways, often depending almost exclusively on the demographics of who the story features. And it gets back to what Mr. Grundy said as well as to like. I don't even know the last time I went to CNN.com. I don't go there. I don't go there unless there's a specific story by a particular person I'm supposed to see. But I don't go there to get my news. And you learn over time places and people that you can trust. And so I don't even, I am less affected now because those stories rarely come across places where I'm viewing the news. I said something. And I want to come up, I'll take a long way around to answer this question. It gets to what students were saying that I don't think that the best outlets for news, I don't think they've even been created yet. And I, I, I think we've only scratched the surface. It is easier today to create a news outlet technologically than it's ever been, financially as well, because of the way we digest our news. Like, do you know, my children don't even know that news comes on television at 5, 5.30, and, and 6. They don't even know that there is such a thing as nightly news. Like, legit, they, they have never seen someone do NBC or ABC or CBS, like that 30-minute news. They don't even know that that is a thing. And, and their peers are the same way because they digest news almost exclusively from their phone. And very little even from laptops or desktops. And so I should just say that the best news sources, I, I think you have not created them yet. And, and the best answer to problems is almost rarely pointing. It's mainly looking like, how can I solve this problem? And um, so I would encourage you, all of you, to consider fresh ways to create new, reliable news sources and it, and it can start off something as simple as a newsletter, right? As simple as um, a really quality, well-managed Facebook page that's really well done, where you share accurate news about the University of Kentucky, accurate news, accurate news about Lexington, about issues of, of systemic racism that aren't properly being addressed. And so where there's a hole, if your response, where there's a dip, if your response is just frustration, that does very little to get you out of the dip. It can fuel your way out, but you have, there have to be actions that you take. Like that statue, the multiple statues, they're not coming down on their own. 
I think we'll be here a hundred years from now, unless there is extreme frustration, and and often that's that's what it takes, or there's something horrific that happens, like the shooting in Charleston. Charleston finally said, "Okay, okay, okay, we'll we'll take another flight." Since nine of you died, we will do we will do you that solid flight, even though you've been asking for it to come down for 45 years. Tomorrow we'll take it. And it shouldn't come to that. And what I see, what I see with this, this fool driving around, that shouldn't be allowed. I, I, I understand there's a freedom of speech piece, but that is, he's doing that clearly for intimidation, driving around in that truck with those flags. You know, it's this, it should be, it should be addressed. Like maybe there could, I'm surprised that there aren't laws about how many times we're allowed to drive. Because in, in hoods all around America, there are laws about if you go around this block three times, we have the right to arrest you. They just put that ordinance in place, and that would solve it. You go around here three times around this block, and you're not actually going somewhere, we can pull you over. Like, that's a, that's a UK may be able to make that ordinance happen. That's, I'm, I'm just thinking on the, on the fly, you know. They do, it, they, do it in, they, they do it in black neighborhoods all over America. They just do it, do it right out there on on these streets and saw that. People said, y'all said, you've been seeing this, like this is daily or just today? I wonder where he gets his gas money from. Like what does he, he do? What does he do for a living? Who is he? <laughs> yeah. Okay, David, David, thank you said, Sean, give your concluding thoughts. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm very grateful. And thank you for being here. We've been together for a couple of hours and, uh, and talking about tough topics. And uh, I think these conversations are important and, and, and sometimes uncomfortable, right? And it's, it's important to sit through uh, the discomfort. And, uh, and I, 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 I want to conclude with this very simple idea. Um, you do have to make, it's not a one-time decision, but you have to make a daily decision to be a part of the solution. And a lot of you have already made that decision. You made it months ago, years ago, but the mistake that you made, I've done this, is that it's not something that you just decide once. It, it is like a daily affirmation for me. I will be a part of the solution. And that also, by necessity, means you are aware of the problems. And, and so that is, why, that is why I'm so disturbed by what Trump and others are saying about Latinos and others that I, I told myself, I will be a part of that solution. I will speak against it. I will fight against it, even if I do so clumsily, right? Because I want you, I want you to see somebody and be like, oh, I'm so touched that he cares. Even if I don't do it expert, right? That it mean that, that means something. And I I, I just if an, it doesn't take huge numbers of us, but it just takes a core of us to be committed to solutions to particular problems, um, to to have that impact. So um, I'm excited to see what happens with so many of you. I, I sense your heart and your desire to make a real difference here on this campus. Understand, for those of you that are students here, this is a, this is a lifetime commitment. Like your degree will come from this institution. So it's worth, it's worth fighting to make it better. Because it's not just what you experience as a student, or you know, some of you are staff members, and this is, this is your this institution is a part of your personal brand. It will be on your LinkedIn profile forever, for as long as LinkedIn lasts. <laughs> Resumes will last forever. And so, yeah, it like, do, don't you want this in the name of this institution to be val valuable and quality? And you do that by fighting to make it better. And so uh, I stand with you. I, I, I just respect so many of you so much. And, uh, and thank you for your support.